People go to financial advisors and I think they think they have to do everything they recommend. And honestly, she probably wasn't the right one because like she did not have children. She did not own property. She was like, if you want to be financially free, you need to, you know, pay your loans off. You can't afford children and a house. Pick one. All these things. And I was like, thank you, but no thank you. But but it was great to talk it out with her, right? And then I went back to the drawing board and created a plan that worked for me. Hey, Journeyers. Today we have on the podcast, Miss Brittany Dandy. She is the founder of Ode to Wellness. She's a content producer, marketing consultant, and she's here to talk about her financial journey to saving over $100,000 and transitioning from freelancer to having a career where she was able to build stability, build more of an income to help support saving that much money. I'm excited to explore more about your journey, Brittany. So welcome to the podcast. Hey, I'm happy to be here. All right, Brittany. So one thing that once you just mentioned or when we were talking a little bit beforehand about your journey, you said, you know, I was a freelancer and I worked as a freelancer, but I wanted to transition and do something different and you mm -hmm. kind of took what you leveraged or leveraged what you learned as a freelancer to create what seems like a very promising, uh, lucrative career. So I'd love to go back a little bit and talk about more of where you started and then we'll go into your financial journey. Yeah. So, um, I started in New York in like traditional media. So was working for like MTV and like other, you know, um, well-known networks in the city and just freelancing. So I would come on for like six months. Sometimes I would come on literally just for a weekend for a show. Um, as I got a little more seasoned, I would get stints that lasted about a year, but never really longer than that. So I was always working more than one job because I was always preparing for a job to end, right? So that became like my normal, just like hustle mentality. So even when I was working at a network, I would still be writing on the side or, you know, be doing like PA work on the side or whatever I could do. Can you explain what your actual, what you did like as a producer or in those mm -hmm. functions or roles? Yeah. So, um, of course, like many people in media, I started out as a production assistant. Um, I was often an in-house, like in-office production assistant, which meant that I was handling like logistics and helping field producers who were more seasoned um, manage their day to day, managing talent and being a liaison between like my field producers and my executive producers in office, right? Um, and then as I got a little more tenure, I became an associate producer and I was doing all the things. It was the first time I'd had interns under me and I was really just trying to like work my ass off so that I could stay, right? That's always the journey and the goal as a freelancer is that you want to stay in some of the places um, that you get to work. I loved freelance work in the sense that I got to experience a lot of different industries. I've worked across like fashion, tech, um, nonprofit, international nonprofit. So I, I've experienced a lot of different, you know, avenues of the business, but the goal was like, oh, I like it here. You know, I want to stay. And that just never happened for me. Like I was literally a freelancer for 10 years. What, <laughs> what did you go? Forever. So what did you go to school for? And did you know that that's what you wanted to do when you graduated? Yes, I knew I wanted to be a television producer when I was 17 years old. My um, goal was MTV. That's what I came to New York with on my heart. I wanted to work at MTV. Um, so I went to school for journalism and mass communications, and my concentration was in uh, media marketing. So I knew I wanted to work on like the business side of media, and I wanted to be a producer. And luckily, that happened. I made my way to becoming um, a producer, but it just never like was a full-time position, and that was the part that sort of sucked. But it was the climate for the, like the time that we came out of school, like nobody really had full-time jobs. Everybody was sort of freelance. And um, I was just freelance much longer than everyone else. <laughs> or like, I didn't, I didn't want to give up, right? There's a lot of opportunities where I could have chosen a different route. I could have done something different, become a teacher, you know, in the field or something else. But like, I didn't want to give up. Um, and when I landed MTV pretty early in my career, that solidified things for me that like it was possible. That was my that was my dream job. So I did that. And then I became more of a traditional journalist, um, a writer at Black Enterprise. And I love that, too. I grew up, you know, seeing these things in my childhood. And now I'm actually in the building and working there. So I was going to stick with it no matter what. Were you still a contract worker then when you worked for Black Enterprise still? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was on I was on contract. Well, and so I can imagine uh, the pay rate or like what you were getting paid and living in New York City. How did you manage finances then? Yeah. Because I know a lot of freelancers and creatives or, you know, people within the more creative space and they don't have steady paychecks or they don't have a consistent job. So I'd love to know yeah. how you managed your finances back then or how you made it work in New York City. Well, back then money was a mess, right? And I mean, not a mess in the sense that I didn't know about money because I've always been very financially conscious. I think um, when I was in college and I was getting like refund checks and things like that, you know, I knew I wanted to buy a property. I just didn't know how. So like the first time I sat down with a banker to discuss a mortgage, I was about 22 um, when I first tried it. So I knew about money. But I just didn't have any. So making it work in New York, I had some family here that allowed me to stay with them. I had an aunt, I had an uncle, and I would just bounce between those two houses, um, staying with them until I saved enough to get my own apartment. And it's so funny because when I, I came to New York twice, the first time I came, I interned and I didn't get a job and I had to leave. And then I came back. Like I came back and like tried again. And when I came back the second time um, after going to grad school, I literally overdrafted my account for the flight. Like I literally bought a ticket I didn't have money for um, to get here. But that's just how bad I wanted to work in New York and I wanted the opportunity. So, yeah, there was just like a bunch of favors. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> I mean, survive. which is you'll hear a lot. I mean, I think we all you literally can't do it alone. And sometimes it is just the help of family members or sometimes strangers or coworkers or someone mm -hmm. giving you a nod, giving you an introduction. Where did you uh, visit from or where did you, where were you raised and where were you born? Originally I'm from South Carolina. So I was going to undergrad in North Carolina at a and um, so I come from there to New York to intern at NBC, which I was really excited about and was hoping that that would turn into a job and it didn't. So after that, I went back home and I was like, what are we going to do? <laughs> so yeah. I went to grad school um, at Syracuse and then after grad school, I came back to the city. And were you still freelancing at that point or describe when you decided that you needed to to change your strategy and try something change different? Things? Um, I was probably, I don't know, about five years in. Um, I think the entire time I've been trying to figure out, like, how do I get on full time somewhere? How does that work? And I really didn't have the answer and there was no one to really tell me. And it, it was never like bad reviews or anything when I'm working, right? Everyone loves you and you're doing a great job, but yet you don't have the full time employment that you want. So I started to look at like adjacent industries and marketing was an adjacent industry that seemed to be a lot more stable. Um, and the first thing I did was like highlight transferable skills. What are the skills that I have that are sort of transferable? Because traditionally, when you become a marketer, you went to school for business marketing and I didn't. But a lot of communication skills do transfer over a lot of understanding a brand and understanding brand goals and how they work and a lot of strategy. Um, so I began to study those things literally on my own. I bought one book. Um, it was this book um, by like a renowned consultant, marketing consultant. And I literally read that book like three or four times where I would just like go back to it when I had a question. And the goal was really to become a consultant on the side and work my way into a company. What was the name of the book, if you can remember? Just so. Oh, I don't and know. If you don't remember, it's okay. It. We can, we, I'll put it in the show notes, but I know that someone listening is like, well, what's the name of the book? I want it to. I know. <laughs> it's by Alan Weiss. I know the, I know the, okay. the um, consultant, but I'll definitely give you the name of the book. All right. When it comes back to you or if we pick it up before, I will mention it and or I'll put it in the show notes so you guys can hear it or look it up. Yeah. Too. All right. So, you knew which it's so this is why I think it's so important, because wherever you are right now, there is a skill that you have. If you don't feel like you're earning enough, you're not happy with your current situation, but you're good at what you do. Um, but it just is not earning you a lot of money. There is something that you're doing currently, no matter what that has a skill, it has a, a skill set that can be transferred into something else that can give you more stability, more money. You just have to okay. figure out what that is. So I love that. That's what you did. Yeah. And it worked. I mean, I literally, um, I got my first consulting gig. I think they paid me $1,200 to come do like a four hour um, branding course for this nonprofit. I traveled to Pennsylvania. I did the course. Well, for, I did like, I did a free consultancy call, which I think people need to understand like this idea of working for free and like how sometimes, but yeah, so like 
I I found this website where you could offer free um, consulting, marketing consulting, or whatever your expertise is to um, different companies that were in need. So I found this nonprofit um, out of like Philly or somewhere that needed consulting around branding. I did the call for like 30 minutes. I made my recommendations to them and they were like, I love your recommendations. Can you do it? And I was like, yeah, I can. And I traveled down there. I did a four hour course. They paid me $1,200, which I didn't know was too low at the time to charge for like everything that I gave them. But it was a start and it was proof of concept that what I was teaching myself was actually working. Do you know if that still exists, this site that you first initially went to? Um, Yeah, it's it's called Catch a Fire. Okay, see, another resource. All right, we're getting the resources. (laughs) No, that's good. So a lot of people, if you are trying to transition, you want to create a resume, a body of work or something to leverage Mm -hmm. so that you can say, hey, I have experience in this thing. So that's great that you were able to find that. When it came to, so transitioning into marketing, right? So that seems like how you got your first clients is catch a fire or, or pitching yourself. But did you have other connections within the industry or p- like people or colleagues that you could ask some of these questions to? Because I know networking mm-hmm. is obviously important and you must have made some great connections within the companies mm-hmm. that, you, that you work for. Um, I did. They came sort of slowly. So as a freelancer, a lot of times you're using recruiters as um, a way to find employment. So I had some like tried and true recruiters that I had built a relationship with um, that were able to like throw things my way. So I would explain like, hey, this is, you know, you know me, this is my additional body of work. However, I want to transition into marketing roles. If you have any like entry level roles you think I'd be good for, please let me know. So I had a recruiter who recommended me to someone who was looking to hire a marketing coordinator. And she said, I don't know, it's a nonprofit. I know you don't do nonprofit, but, you know, just have a conversation and see. So I met with a woman in in person and we had a conversation and she felt like, though I didn't have all the experience, I had enough understanding of what marketing like was. Like she asked me some strategic questions about how would I approach things? And she felt I answered those questions really well. And she was like, I think your personality would work really well with the director that I just hired. She was like, I think she would love you. And she did. We actually are like lifelong friends from from way back then till now. Like she became one of my mentors and we worked really well together. Um, But that's how I got my first marketing role. And it was actually for an international um, nonprofit. So a really big nonprofit that I walked into um, and became their coordinator and later became their communications um, manager for in, during an interim period. Right. How long ago was this? Just to give us a timeline. Um, it's before I got married. So it was like 2015, maybe I got that gig like early 2015 and I stayed there um, for that whole year. And it was great because I was getting married in 2016. So it was nice to have like consistent work. It was still a contract, um, but it was nice to have consistent work while there. And then on the side, um, I would teach classes and do different things because I was saving for a wedding. So me and my husband both like worked two jobs and gigs at the time to save for the wedding. Right. All you're still in New York. So talk a bit more now what happens and how your career, you transition it into having a permanent role and increasing your income. Yeah. So I did that for that year. We got married. Things are different now, right? Um, We paid off. Our wedding was not expensive. It was like 15K and we paid it all in cash because we both worked double jobs to make that happen. I didn't want any debt. Um, And because of that, I decided like we need more money. We had been in the same apartment for years. So in terms of like living in New York and how do you make it work, You get into a building and you stay in that building forever (laughs) so that your rent does not increase, um, you know, but so much. So uh, I was in the same apartment for a total of like six years, um, which was really good. Even after we had our first baby, I was in that apartment. But in terms of like leveling up with finances, I decided I wanted a full time role and I was going to transition to where I needed to go to get it. So it's like, how do I maneuver within this new marketing space to find something that's more lucrative that pays more money? Well, tech pays a lot more money in the marketing space. Um, so I immediately started to identify tech roles. And back to you mentioning like 
networking, I did have a few friends who were more connected than I was. And I started telling them, like, I want to work in tech. I started just talking about it. Like, I want to work in tech. Can you send me a lead? And one of my friends sent me a recruiter who recruits for tech companies. And it took me like weeks to reach out because I did all this mental, you know, I'm not prepared and I don't know this world very well. And just like redoing my resume 60 times. And she was like, just reach out to her. And I did. And I sent her my resume and she loved it. And I had like three or four interviews because, you know, tech is ridiculous with the number of interviews you go through. Um, But I got the gig and it was still contract, but it was now contract in the tech space. And I think that's important to understand is like, I've been on contracts at so many different levels from like, you know, $16 an hour to $50 an hour to $100 an hour. So like when you're a contract worker, people think it's all bad, but you can be on contract and still save a good bit of money if you're on a high paying contract. Well, and at this point, your dual income with your husband, who you said was working, so I'm assuming he's still working. Yeah. So combining now you transferring into tech, getting a higher per hour or, or contract Ray, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's, it's super beneficial. Yeah, what you guys are doing. It definitely made a difference. By this time, we are married, and he's working consistently. Um, and now I'm on this contract in the tech space where I'm locked in for a year. So what? So how did you? Did you get a full time role within the same company? I'm, I'm, and the reason why I want to ask questions like this is just because I know the. Uh, the way that people can transition and or move around within companies or different companies is important to the Mm -hmm. income, right? I think income is a leading force on how you'll reach your financial goals and ultimately financial independence. And for Mm -hmm. so many people listening, it's like the love what they do, but don't earn enough contract work. It's unstable or, Hmm. Should I find something else, something that I might like, not love as much as I currently do, but there's more money, but then, mm-hmm. and it, but it allows me to then reach my financial goals. And so it sounds mm-hmm. like you had a love for marketing for you to teach it to yourself. And you found those tangential commonalities between what you were doing in marketing, but then also it, you realize you, you just needed more money uh, for what you wanted mm-hmm. in your life. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, to answer your first question, I didn't get a full-time role at this company. Um, which sucked (laughs) because I I wanted to. But what I did, like, I think the key thing for me has been leverage. Like you have to leverage at every stage of your life, at every every point and every pivot, you have to find something that you can leverage. So even though I didn't get a full-time role, I didn't negotiate more money. So like I came in at the rate, um, the rate that was offered. I accepted that rate because it was more money than I'd ever made in my life. So I was excited. Um, But then I learned more about negotiation, right? And I immediately got into that space and looked for mentors and sponsors. So I did find a mentor and a sponsor in that space who helped me like redo my resume during that year, who helped me navigate corporate America because the biggest hurdle was that I'd never lived in a corporate environment like that. I didn't speak the language. I didn't know how to navigate it. I didn't understand stakeholders. And I had to find people to teach me that. So that's what I spent that year doing. And that's what you leverage. So when the contract was up, I had worked my way into a new contract in, from inter, from internal, like internally did that work and found a new contract without the help of a recruiter. So I gave myself another year within that space on a different team. Um, and that's the beauty of, of leverage. You have to find, you know, something you can turn into something else. Right. So ultimately, where did you end up or what were you, what did you end up? Yeah. Doing? So I actually, because I'm a producer at heart, right. I spoke a lot about my love for producing and I have this video experience and this brand experience that no one else has here. So I wound up on a new team in the role of producer um, who specialized in video and, and was managing a project that was, you know, $900,000 project because I understood video more than anyone else in the space. So I was able to use my background from, from before, right? From the beginning of working at network television to now leverage it in the tech space because they don't have that expertise there. So it really came full circle. 
And I mean, from there, now I have the marketing experience. I have the producer experience. I understand how to work with large budgets. I understand how to work with stakeholders. Now I can find a full-time role at an advertising company where all those things are needed. And that's exactly what I did. I wound up getting a a full-time role at an ad company um, where I was a client-facing producer who liaised with stakeholders and was able to leverage all those nuggets along the way into this full-time six-figure role um, where I had finally had benefits. And I was, I was really grown. I was, what was I, 30? I was, I, like, I, was, I was 32. I was 32. I was like grown, grown by the time I got this first full-time role, which like for some people would look at and be like, wow, that sucks. But it didn't. It just took a really long time to get all the pieces that I needed. Um, and I and by then, like now I'm teaching marketing. Right. Because like I've always told you, I had to, I've always had more than one job. So even when I was at this tech company on this six figure contract, because I'm on a contract, but I'm making six figures, I was still teaching at night. So I was teaching um, marketing to continuing education students at night to also save money and to just like keep myself sharp on the information. Because remember, I'm a self-taught marketer, so I don't know everything. (laughs) So like, it just helped me, you know? I mean, that's a, it's amazing. And this is why I say collect the coins. I've referenced this before, but like in a video game, like sometimes you'll get like, if you're playing, you'll, they'll give you tools or coins and you don't need Mm -hmm. it right away. And you're like, why do I need this? But you don't pick it up, put it in your bag. And then five levels away or 10 levels down the road, you're like, this is what it's for, right? This is the key, the key that I didn't know I needed, what I needed it for. This key unlocks yeah. the next door. So keep keep picking up your keys and coins, even though you don't understand what it's for yet, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's for a reason. All right. I love how you talk about still having your full-time job, but working on the side, sharpening your skills, which you know has led you to start your own businesses. But- was it before or after? Because I know you becoming a mother was the kind of start or the reason that you started to save so much money. So yeah. I'd love to talk about that saving journey and what prompted you and your husband to start doing that and just that transition. Yeah. So because I have this unconventional, you know, past and trajectory, um, and I live in New York, right? I'm young. I'm in New York. It's you know, it's not really cool to be married and have kids and, and do other things. I'd already gotten married, um, but the kids thing, I wasn't on board with having children. And my husband really wanted kids, and I was just like, "Why? We can just go to brunch forever." Like I was <laughs> not into it at all. But I knew um, if I was going to explore motherhood, I was going to need something to make me feel secure and comfortable in that journey because we don't have family here in New York. Um, I lost my mother and my father at 26. So there was no one for me to like lean on. It's not like mom and dad are going to help. So it was just a different journey for me. And when I got the contract um, that was six figures, I was like, okay, like, I wonder, you know, six figures is is an arbitrary thing people say, right? And that can be 100K or that can be 200K. And I started to understand money a little more in that space. And I was like, you know, I, I would set a goal, like, can we save 200K? Like, can we make, or can we bring in that amount of income? And I would just set these various goals and we would hit them. And it might take, you know, an extra gig here and there. Um, so once I started to explore the motherhood situation and unpack, like, why I didn't want to be a mom. And I realized that, like, I had this obsession with success. I was obsessed with winning. And that's how the, the money goals were falling into place, right? Because it was a game for me. And I also was just like dealing with a lot of grief. And because I had so much grief going on, I was allowing it to sort of like dictate my choices. And I was like, I don't really want to be in love with anyone in that way anymore. Um, So once I unpacked all of that, I was like, okay, what would make you secure? What would make you feel comfortable um, as a mom? And I think I narrowed it down to wealth, wellness, and work. Those were the things that I was Mm -hmm. uncertain about. So I began to like put in you know, these stability markers within those three pillars. And for the work part of it, I I was working on that. I was trying to secure this full-time job. And that didn't come to after my daughter was born. She was three months old when I got that full-time contract. Um, but it had been in the works, right? So I did what I did before. I started talking to my network about wanting that full-time role. Like, hey, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And part of it is letting people know that you're looking. Um, and when it came to wellness, 
I'm a big gym person. I had been training for a while. Training for what? I don't know. Life. Like I was yeah. just in the gym, right? But now I had attached a purpose to it because I was like, if I'm going to have a kid, I want to be like my strongest self. This is a marathon. Like I knew you needed a lot of core work to carry a child. I, that was that that was that stability piece I put there. And then for wealth, uh, me and my husband sat down with a financial advisor and discussed like where we are, what we currently had, our income, and the things that we wanted. So we told her that we wanted a baby, we wanted a home, um, and we wanted to be financially free at some point. And she gave her, us her recommendations, which, mind you, we didn't do a lot of them. I want to say that because people go to financial advisors and I think they think they have to do everything they recommend. And honestly, she probably wasn't the right one because like, she did not have children. She did not own property. And she just was like, pay off all your student loan debt. <laughs> Her advice, because we had like a little bit in the bank then, maybe like 30K or something between the two of us. Like it wasn't a ton, but she was like, you should take that money and like throw it at your loans. And I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> like, you know, I can I considered it and I'm so glad I didn't listen to her because right after that, the pandemic happened and everything was suspended. And ultimately, like, she was like, if you want to be financially free, you need to, you know, pay your loans off. You can't afford children and a house. Pick one all these things. And I was like, thank you, but no, thank you. But, but it was great to talk it out with her. Right. And then I went back to the drawing board and created a plan that worked for me. Okay. I love <laughs> that you shared this about your financial advisor, because I think the real reason you, so you, it's important to, cause I use a financial advisor firm that helps just, uh, you know, give advice, direct us on what our next best, best steps are. But I also don't always necessarily agree or do the things I ask. Part of it is because I haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> but a lot <laughs> of it is, you know, I push back. I'm like, I don't know about this. And this is why self-education and knowing your own goals are important because no matter what, no matter the most talented person or even advisor who's, who is supposed to be just give facts, has have mm -hmm. their own experiences or opinion about something. And so you have to understand or know, have discernment to say what you need and what you don't need. And sometimes you don't know what you need. And so you want to talk yep. it out, like you said, and have those conversations. But sometimes you don't have to take everything that is given to you. And I feel like, you know, so much of why people, when they do hook up with, whether it's listening to podcasts or reading blogs, it's like they just follow whatever the next thing the person said to do. No, it's gather the mm -hmm. information, do more research if you need, see how it applies to your situation, how you feel and how it works for your goals and then make the yeah. best decision for you that you know of at the time. So I love that you did that. And that's, that's all, and that's all you yeah. can do is like the best thing at the time. And it, it was a culmination of all those things, right? It was podcasts like yours. It was like listening to all the resources I could listen to and then going to her. Because I also want to say like, you have to prep for that engagement. And I think listening to podcasts and other people's journey gave me the tools I needed to be able to ask the right questions when meeting with the financial advisor. Otherwise, you're just sitting there and they're just talking to you and you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's important to understand who you're, this is also with friends or fellow colleagues, there might be goals you'll have for yourself. And because they don't understand those goals or they can't do it, they're going to look at you like, that's not, you can't do that or tell you all the reasons why it's not possible. Or yeah. they just might have a different level of risk. And so they're like, I wouldn't do that. And it's like, so there's so many yeah. things that I know that people would not have done, like yeah. that I've done. And because they don't have the level of risk taking that I have, or they, they just, just, they're just different. And so you really have to have that self compass within yourself to know like, okay, this person does not, she, they, they don't maybe have a house. I don't know what they have, but like, let's just say you can't go to someone to say that you want to own a house, have kids and do all these things. If that's not a goal for them, or they don't believe things like that are possible because they're going to tell you why it can't work, which will discourage yeah. you from making it work. It did. And I think the biggest thing that I took away was that number one, she didn't have those experiences, so she couldn't really speak to them. And number two was that um, nothing that she advised me to do was, it was like liquid, it's taking all my liquid money and giving it away. There was nothing that was giving me a return, like in her recommendations outside of like retirement funds, which were, were being put in place. Um, so I couldn't imagine taking everything we had liquid and just paying off loans. It just didn't make sense to me. 
All right. So why did you decide to do uh, leaving that meeting yeah. or those meetings? Um, we went back home and we was like, what are we going to do now? So <laughs> we, we, we decided number one to leave the option of having kids open. So we weren't going to like, you know, necessarily try, but weren't going to prevent that. It's like, if we have a baby, we have a baby. Um, I also was exploring opportunities for work in other places. I started to explore like moving to the West coast and like, you know, going to wherever, the money and the opportunities existed because I couldn't just say I'm going to stay in New York. So I would say like, be flexible about where you're going to go to achieve this, to achieve the thing. Right. So it turns out the baby happened first. So, um, while I was, and I, and I wanted to buy a property, right? So I started to explore neighborhoods in the city that were sort of untouched. So in New York, we looked at like East New York, we looked at, you know, Brownsville, these, these places that hadn't been really touched yet. While doing that, the pandemic happened and oh, I'm pregnant. So, you know, we're like excited that we're having this, this baby. Um, and because we knew we were open to, for that, we started saving a lot too. I don't want to skip over that. Like we're still, we're saving this whole time because we don't know what we're going to do, but we don't get, we want to do something and we're going to need money to do it. So we're still picking up gigs here and there. I'm still working those two jobs and we're still storing that money away. And we opened up a high yield savings account, a Marcus account where we started to save jointly. So my husband had his own retirement accounts and I had mine, but we wanted to start saving jointly. So we're just throwing money in there. So once we find out we're pregnant, I knew that I wanted to have um, a nanny for my child. I wanted individual childcare, especially during the pandemic. I mean, it wasn't even an option for me to choose daycare or anything like that. So I wanted to save for a year of childcare. And in New York, that's expensive, you know? So we knew we needed about 30K. That's probably on the low end <laughs> to save for child care. So we saved for that. And we knew we wanted a home. So we're saving for whatever that down payment is. And we knew we had a few options when it came to purchasing a home. We knew we had FHA. My husband's a veteran. We knew we had the VA loan. So we didn't have to save, you know, the 20% or anything like that, but we knew we needed money to save and we wanted a multifamily property. So we also knew that the ticket on that was going to be a lot higher than buying a single family home. Okay. So you got, you, you have the, the, the situation, the, your current situation, you have the goals in place. So it's still the goals of I'm having a baby, I want to buy a house. What were the next steps in making those goals become true? So I love how you talked about looking for real estate in, you know, the, the fringe, you know, fringe neighborhoods mm -hmm. maybe that have not experienced as much gentrification yet, even though I feel like there's mm -hmm. some of that going on now. But what, how did you, you know, talk more about finding the home and then still saving? Because it's, you still were able yeah. to save that. So that 90K to 100K that you saved, this was happening all at the time of finding out you're pregnant and looking for that house. Yeah. yeah so okay. we're saving that 90, we're saving that 90 K um, during that time. So by the time baby is born, there's 90 K in the bank and it's like, well, now it's time to start to put those funds to use. Right. So, um, sorry, how long her, one, just see if I can interject, how long did it take you to save that 90 K? Do you remember? I want, I want to say a year. Were because you yeah yeah go ahead i was gonna say it, it was it was it was probably a year i don't think it was over it maybe maybe but not i was able to store like stow away so much money because our rent was eleven hundred dollars like we had been in that same tiny apartment for so long right like i was there by myself then my husband moves in we get married he has two incomes i have two incomes you know so like and and the rent is not changing so we're able to really like put away a lot of money and I'm on a six figure contract. So that's right. why we were able to do it sort of quickly. What were you doing with the money? Cause I, I find that when I also switched, there was a point in our lives, my husband and I, where we started hyper saving and investing a lot of money. And then people also ask me, okay, well, what were you doing? So before you started saving and investing all that money, what did you do before that? So what were the changes? Like, what were you spending your money before on mm -hmm. that you were, and then, or did you make any changes to save additionally? Like, what was that switch? And did you cut anything back? Did you, did you have to let your friends know, Hey, we're not doing the trips <laughs> or going out? Like, what did that look like? To be honest, we didn't cut back. We, um, I like to travel and I, between the two of us, I spend more. Um, he's very laid back. He doesn't spend a lot. 
but we didn't cut back. I like to travel. My birthday's in February. So every February I'm going someplace warm. That's just a thing. So we still traveled. I took him to Cuba one year for his birthday. And this is like, we're not making a lot, but we don't, we're not living lavishly, right? We kept our rent low, which I think was the main thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we would eat out occasionally, but nothing too crazy. I don't think we had to make a lot of changes on the spending end. I think the changes came to like where we're saving the money. So like we stopped using our traditional debit cards altogether. We started building our credit Um, before the baby came. We started just putting everything on credit um, and building our credit as fast as we could. And we opened that Marcus account and started saving in a place that made more sense than our traditional bank accounts. So we made more changes on like the income end and the saving end um, than like spending wise. I don't think we were doing that bad spending wise. Okay, that that makes sense. And it sounds very similar to my story, which again, highlighting the importance of income and being a dual income household that, you know, not to skip over that and saving on rent or mortgage because it, that is your highest expense usually. So if you can save on that and it's two p- people uh, household and you're both earning or hustling to earn money that you can go a long way with that. Yeah. And it was an older building. We were really tired of living there, but it just didn't make sense to leave. Like we were like, we can't, that can't change. It did change later though. Um, So my daughter was born and three months later, I got this full-time job and I got that job through networking. So a woman I had met, I don't know, two years prior at like a backyard party, literally, we just connected and we always stayed in touch. And she said, I see you had a baby. Congratulations. Like, let's catch up. We got on the phone. She's like, I just got this new job at this place, this advertising company. And I was like, oh, really? Like, I'm looking. And she was like, oh, I'll send a referral for you. And she sent the referral. Like, I had to, like, take a test and all this stuff to, like, get the gig. But, like, that's how I got that opportunity. Like, just telling someone what you want. <laughs> like- that's so amazing. Listen, I, and you know what's crazy? Like, that's someone that was already in your network who didn't even know. It's not like she reached out and said, hey, do you want this? She, and then, But when you mention mm-hmm. it, because I think sometimes we just think, like, well, if, if the, pers- the person that should want to help me should just know but they don't and so you reach say something whether it's facebook linkedin what you're you know what you're looking for what that opportunity is that you are searching for because you just never know that you might have someone who's just like oh it's like nothing to them to make a reference or send an email it was nothing (laughs) for her and she's not someone that i was close to she's just someone like we just like each other and we keep in touch um so yeah, that worked out. So my, my baby is three months old and I go back to work and now it's time to pay for the nanny. And that was a whole thing, girl, hiring a nanny. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. It was like a foreign concept. I couldn't talk to anyone about it because it just in our community, like, you know, having a nanny is not like an everyday thing in America anyway. I know other places it's very normal, but um, we were very like, it was very weird for everybody and just trying to learn how to do that. <laughs> This might warrant some conversation here because I do feel, you know, it is definitely a, a luxury and privilege to be able to afford like childcare, additional uh, childcare if you're not sent, even just sending your kid to daycare, you know, like that is expensive. Yeah. Um, if it's private daycare that you have to pay for, but in general, because as women who often are uh, the breadwinners or bringing just as much to the table financially to then have the responsibility of raising a child, carrying the child and raising the child. (laughs) Um, Then the household itself, there's so much put on us where no wonder why we're tapped out with our internal resources, right? Like what we can do for ourselves and the people around us and creativity wise or in the workforce. So I do, I do feel like having that support and that resource, if you can, um, or planning for it is such a key thing that we don't talk much about or even just help within the household, paying for, uh, you know, someone to help come and clean or um, yeah. someone to help manage the schedule, whatever that looks like. So I talk about a little bit the the conversations or the shame. I don't know if you felt shame, but the uh, because it's not a normal but, thing in your circle, maybe what that felt like. Doing. Oh, yeah. It was okay. So two things, right? It was not normal. So I had to, I had to be mindful of who I shared certain things with. And then let's take, take it back to like me deciding what motherhood looks like for me, right? Motherhood for me looks like having this individualized childcare. It looks like being able to hire someone to come in and clean should I need it. It looks like having that additional help because of our circumstance. We don't have family here. So that was important to me. And I chose to honor that. 
And it was more important for me to honor what I needed than to keep explaining myself to people about why I was choosing to do said thing. So I just stopped talking to them about it because they don't live my life, right? They li- they're living a different life and that's totally okay. But for me and my husband, we knew we're going to save the money to have the things that we need. And we did just that. And it worked out just fine. I found a great nanny. Um, and she worked with us on the price. You know, she also did like light cleaning, which was great. She came from like a 10 year family where she'd been with them forever. So like she had more experience about children than I did, which was kind of what I needed, you know, not having a mom and like not really having people to turn to. It was really helpful to have someone there. So like for me, I always tell women that's, you know, honor what you need on your journey and don't necessarily validate that with anyone else. Just keep it to yourself. <laughs> And it's just, and it's what you value in your investment, right? Some people that might not be what they value, and it could be something else that they'd want to save yeah. and spend money on. So really important, to even prioritize, because I mean, they're like maybe it's you want all the things, which is fine, right? You want the nanny, mm-hmm. you want the nice car, you want the vacations, that's fine too. Mm-hmm. But prioritize really the stage at life in that life you're in, and where your resources are going to be best deployed, so that you can be your best self or whatever that looks like yeah. for you. For sure. And and I think we did just that. Like having the additional care was important to us. Um still traveling was important to us. I love to travel. I like I, I love New York, but I have to leave. So like I didn't want that to stop. You know, like there were certain things we had to prioritize, which meant not having certain things, right? So like we had a kid, but we don't have a car. So we gave we just decided, okay, we'll just use transit. And is it hard? Yeah. <laughs> But we gave up that so that we could still do the travel, you know, and we did. We traveled um, the first year she was born. We took her to see her grandparents. We took her to Mexico. We spent two weeks in Mexico with the baby. And I mean, that's what, you know, you have to prioritize what means a lot to you. Yeah, yeah. Now, so you did eventually find the home or the house, I'm assuming. I did. We found the home. Um, So before we found the home, we moved to the neighborhoods. I remember I told you we were in that same apartment for six years, Um, but it was just like really old. We had the baby in there for the first six months and it was a lot to hike from where we were in Brooklyn over to the neighborhoods we were thinking about buying in. So we decided ultimately the pandemic is here. Rent dropped super low. And we knew it wasn't going to stay that way, right? So it was like, let's take advantage of this time period. So we found an apartment in East New York, moved to East New York so we could live there and see if that was really what we wanted to purchase. And we lived there for a year. And we were on a very strict timeline because I knew rent was going to go back up, right? As the pandemic goes down, the prices go skyrocket. And that's exactly what happened. So we moved to that new home. We looked for a house. And literally a month before our lease was ending, We found a house and went under contract. (laughs) So we wound up having to like extend our lease for like 30 days, but we made it. (laughs) Right, right. And for the non-New Yorkers, East New York is in Brooklyn. Uh, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Very familiar with East New York. So no, that is great. Uh, And so it worked out. It seems like the goals you set for yourself uh, worked out. And so now talk a little bit about what you're doing, you know, Career-wise, how you're juggling, you know, motherhood, you just, I don't know if you want to make the announcement here, but you're no longer a mother of one. Now you're- Yeah, yeah. no, a mom of two. A mom Recently, of two now. Yeah. Yes, as of last week. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, so we, we bought the house. We bought the multifamily house. I want to say that um, we did find a multifamily and we, and we purchased um, using a VA loan, which was so clutch. <laughs> Yeah. Well, okay. I want you to still answer that first question, but now I have another just question just because real estate. Let's talk a little bit about that because you did venture deeper into Brooklyn, into Mm -hmm. maybe a place that like people will say, you know, it's a little, can be a little rough depending on where you go, depending what block Mm -hmm. you're on. So talk about, talk about um, that decision and kind of like the give and take and how it's been so far, because I, I find that a lot of people feel like they're priced out. A buying a home in New York. And so mm-hmm. I'd love to hear more about your experience and your thought process on that. Yeah. I mean, I had to get used to seeing those numbers and that just came with like market research. Like the numbers are, are higher because of the market that we're in. So it wouldn't be fair to compare this to like where I'm from in South Carolina or, 
you know, Texas or it's just not fair. Like it's a different kind of market. So number one was like getting familiar with that. And then moving into the neighborhood definitely helped because I wasn't, I, I was, I thought it was sketch too. Like this is a, this is an area that when I first moved to New York city, I did not come to very often because I thought it was dangerous or, you know, whatever, but living in the neighborhood, I felt like was the best way to know for sure. So once we lived here, I got to know my neighbors. I got to know the history of the neighborhood. I can walk from where we where we were renting over to where we are now. And I used to do that and just walk around. And there's like a beautiful park and like kids that play softball on the weekend. And like, I think when you live in a neighborhood, you get to see for yourself. And it's like, is is there crime and things? Yes, but there was crime where I was living before. There's crime everywhere. Um, now I know like city council, you know what I mean? Like you yeah. literally have to like immerse yourself in the neighborhood. And and that's why it's also so important because I don't want people to, like, listen, I love East New York. I love Brooklyn. There's so many different areas of Brooklyn, but why as someone who was going to move, potentially buy in the area um, is to get to, to, to help with the community, to understand the community, to get involved with the local community, right? To to help to if you're gonna plant your seeds there, like it's gonna be great seeds to help foster a like a beautiful garden because there there are there's so much great development happening. And and so that's the other thing I, mm-hmm. I, I feel for people like look in look all around. Like yes, there are statistics and there are things happening, but it happens, you know, quite often, you know, honestly all over New York City at this point. So it's it, it does. Yeah. And one thing I did, okay, two things. First thing was I connected with a group of Black women homeowners who were buying all over the tri-state. And I did that about two years prior. And I'd been like just embedded in them for the past two years. That's how I got to ask my questions. That's how I learned what questions to ask. Um, That's how I got leads on realtors and things of that nature. That was the first thing, to find community. And then the second thing was to utilize resources like online. So I looked up Um, the city plans to see what was developing in New York and when. And, you know, East New York and Brownsville do, they do have development planned over the next five to 10 years for these areas. So, you know, it may be areas that are not booming, but those are the areas that you want. You want to be like the early adopter. And to your point, you want to come in and make a difference. And we know our entire block, like most of our block has been here 20 years and they were so excited to see like young people come into the neighborhood and they've been so helpful. Like my neighbor helps us grow the grass. He's like, you gotta buy this. Like, you know, it's really, it's really like some Sesame street type. (laughs) Like Everybody's really helpful. Um, But yeah, like utilize those city plans and resources that can help you make those decisions that are not like emotion based. That's just a a financial decision that um, this area is going to grow and there is going to be money invested here. So you want to get in early. Right. Now talk more now about your career. You're starting O2 Us Wellness, why you started that and what you're working on now. Yeah. So I started O2 Us Wellness to help women do exactly what I did. I want them to get brave and decisive about motherhood. I want them to figure out what they need as women. Um, If they want to be moms, if they don't, either is fine. Both of those are a motherhood decision. But if they do want to be a mother, um, I want to support them in those three areas, right, of work, wellness, and wealth. And what do you need to feel secure, especially for ambitious women? I think we often feel like if I have children, I'm going to miss out on this or my work trajectory is going to be interrupted and I want to help them navigate that space. So I launched Ode to Us to do exactly that. Um, We are a wellness company and we help new moms and women considering motherhood. So you don't have to be partnered or pregnant or anything. You just have to be considering motherhood um, to, to build a pathway that helps them better know like what they may need as a mama and how to prepare for that when the time comes. I love that. What advice would you give someone who's listening? Maybe they, they're the younger you, you know, when you just, when you came to New York, you had all those, freelance jobs you're just like <laughs> like what am i going to do what advice would you give your your older your younger self or someone listening who says yeah one day i want to buy that home and i you know i want to have a family I, I don't know if i can afford that i want to i want to live the life i'm supposed to live or i want to live what advice would you give them to help realize that um i guess like the first thing would be like seeking people who are doing and 
those things that you want to do so that you can see it, that it's know that it's tangible and ask questions. Um, that was really helpful for me to see women who were living the life that I wanted to live. Um, don't share things that you want with people who may not understand them or don't want them. I think there's some things you should keep to yourself. Um, and that's not to say, you know, they don't love you. They, they might love you, but they may not understand what you want. And I think um, who you're speaking those things to really matters. So like evaluating your community and your circle and being strategic. I'm a very strategic person. And I mentioned leverage before. I think you should always be thinking about how do I leverage this opportunity it could be a small opportunity. It could be a volunteer opportunity. I have I've leveraged volunteer work, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but just get strategic in getting to your goals. Like there's a thousand ways to to get there. Oh my gosh, this is great, Brittany. Please tell everyone where they can find <laughs> out more about you, your work, and your company O2S Wellness. Yeah, you can find Ode to Us at OdeToUs.com. You can find me on Instagram at Brittany, B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y, C Dandy, at um, at Instagram and on TikTok. And yeah, I'm I'm around if anyone has questions. I'm I'm really hyped to answer like money questions or mommy questions. So <laughs> feel yeah. free to reach out. <laughs> well, I will tag all your socials in the wherever you listen to this. So you just click more or description. You'll find um, more about Brittany. And then if you are listening to this and you know, something stood out to you, you got encouraged and show us that you're listening, take a screenshot, tag us, tag me at uh, journey to launch and tag Brittany. I'll tag her um, Instagram again in there and Twitter or whatever. Are you on Twitter? No, um, no. Okay. You can't be on all the things. No. It's fine. But <laughs> just, um, let us know. I just love when I hear people who are like listening in real time, sharing what they learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really helpful to you know this, to, like what you just said, like resonated, it helped. So Brittany, thank you so much again for sharing your, this wealth of knowledge and your journey with us. This was amazing. Thank you for having me.